Man, doesn't it feel loving and awesome in here tonight? Isn't this a good atmosphere? Does it feel good in here? Shoo! Just people seem excited. That Just the perception of the atmosphere is amazing. Is that song incredible or what? I was just saying to the one young lady, there's songs that people are writing. You have to have a revelation to write a song like that. I mean, and it's amazing how God is shifting things because when I was young going to church, I don't know how well that song would have been received. I think people would have tried to break it down and critique it and tell you why it can't be the way God is. But <laughs> it's amazing how we resist things that are good and life-giving and freedom, you know. <laughs> Try to put some kind of bummer on the end of it or something. <laughs> Come on, while you were yet a sinner, he sent his son. One of the most beautiful things of the gospel is that he makes us righteous. Where's Mark at? You blessed me. Where's Mark at? There you are. Yeah, don't hide. Just thank you, man. When you got up here, you don't even know you did this. Because he was passionate. Mark was just in it. And I was looking over there going, you go, Mark. <laughs> and I was just happy. And he talked something about healing. There's healing here. You can feel it, etc. And the Lord was just speaking to me and said, I, I always want you to preach. You're a teacher. And he's emphasized preaching rather than ministering over the last two years, three years of my life to really give the word. The word is important. And, but yet tonight, at the same time, I felt like we're going to do a lot of praying for some things. And there's going to be a ton of healing in this room tonight. There just is. And he said it. He said it, and he said, I feel healing. There's just healing. Can you feel it? It's just healing in the room. And, it's, and I'm like, God, you're just telling me. And he's just that, at that moment sitting here saying, I want to heal a lot of things. And I'm like, okay. And, and then, the, and then the, the other thing, which is very rare that I get any direction before I come up here. You don't understand. Like, I don't usually have a clue what I'm going to say to. I get up here and start talking, and then I'm on a journey with you. Seriously, it's exactly like that. Like, when you listen to me preach, you know I don't have notes. I couldn't have notes. But he said, he said, Sermon on the Mount. No, there's, there's a lot of things Jesus said on the Sermon on the Mount. It's like three straight chapters of red letters, man. It's two for sure. I think it's three. Three, right? Straight red. Phew. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for. And I'm sitting over there and he's talking about, to my heart, about freedom from sin, and, and we were talking, some of the guys from Alabama, and we were having fun about it. I said, did you ever see, and we were talking about a message that I've done before, and I said, it's probably on YouTube, and they went, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it came in my heart, and I thought, man, that's, that's exciting, and I felt like I was supposed to do that. And then you get up there, righteousness, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Listen, righteousness is what Jesus, he rules his kingdom with a scepter of righteousness. It tells you to not be unskilled in the word of righteousness. Yeah? Righteousness is a big deal. There's two uses of righteousness in your New Testament Bible. One is the God-given ability through the blood of Jesus and the finished work of the cross to stand before him accepted without any sense of guilt, condemnation, or shame. Clean before God. Watch this. As if. This is what people struggle with, but it's what righteousness is. As if you've never sinned. We get so caught up with, yeah, but brother, we're always going to sin. Yeah, but we're still going to sin. Yeah, but brother. And we miss the power of righteousness so that grace can empower our lives to become what we've never been before. So we're so busy thinking we have to confess what we've been, we might not be releasing faith to become what he paid for. You hunger and thirst for righteousness, what's that really mean? I mean, you shall be filled. There's a response from God. He doesn't want you to just long for it in something you can never walk in, right standing with God. I'm right in the sight of God. I wake up without any sense of guilt. I have access to him through the blood of Jesus Christ, which is speaking better things. So the other use of righteousness is the work of righteousness. It's, it's you walking in righteousness, work in righteousness. That's... Any expression of the nature of God through your life is a work of righteousness. You're a tree of righteousness. That, that means when you're done wrong and you show mercy and make peace, you're working righteousness. When you cop an attitude and get frustrated and offended, you're just like any man that doesn't know God or went to church. You just go to church. They don't. I'm not being mean. 
There's a sanctification in the kingdom. There's something that makes us different. His life is inside of us, Tom, right? Hunger and thirst for righteousness. Your trees of righteousness, the planning of the Lord. It's not presumption. Don't be afraid. Pastors, preachers, teachers, don't be afraid to preach righteousness. Don't think it empowers people to stay the same. If you preach it clear, it empowers them to change. Don't be afraid to preach grace. We're not saved apart from grace. You are what you are by the grace of God. We've received grace for grace. You're saved by grace through faith. Just because somebody went off the deep end with the word grace doesn't mean it's not what the gospel functions by. Don't red flag the word grace or you can't preach the gospel. Yeah, see, even the little baby got it. (laughs) That's a little baby that laughed right along with us. That had to be Jesus tickling the belly or something. Grace, God's willingness to use his power and ability on your behalf when you don't deserve it to help you to become something you couldn't be on your own. It's the grace of God. You're saved by grace through faith. I'll just throw this out there quick because I got to go somewhere tonight. We got a lot to do. Wow. And we'll get her done (laughs) sometime. No, we'll get her done. You preach grace apart from transformation. You're preaching perversion. The whole reason for grace is the change of your life, not the allowance of your life. You can't get caught in this language out there that says, well, Jesus just loves me for who I am. Jesus loves me no matter what. Of course he loves you, but what about you loving him? What about you responding to who he is? What about you getting a grip and and letting his love start to produce some change in your life rather than just holding on to something that's not really real? When you're using the love of God as an alibi to stay the same, you're using the love of God for your sake. It's not the love of God that you're... But the whole time God loves you. He doesn't love you for where you've been and what you've done. He loves you for what you're created to be and your calling and your destiny and your purpose. The reason he can see past where you've been and what you've done because he knows you can be so much more and he knows what you'll look like when he's in you and you're surrendered. And he believes that's worth paying for. Yeah? So righteousness is a big deal. Righteousness is right standing with God. It's through the blood of Jesus being seen as if you've never sinned. Jesus gets raised from the dead in John 20. Raised from the dead. In John 20, they all watched him die. They're in a room in fear of the Jews. They're assembled together and afraid. Jesus walks into their fear festival or whatever they're having in there. He walks in. See, when he comes from the dead, Mary's at the tomb. Bless you, ladies. I mean, there's things we can learn from you girls. I mean it. And, 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 and the guys are assembled for fear. They're afraid that what happened to him is going to happen to them soon. She don't care anymore. She just lost the best thing that ever was. And she's gone. She knows he's behind that stone. She can't get to him. And she knows he's dead, but he's there and she loves him. That girl's going to the rock there. She's going to lean against it and rub oil on it or something. I don't know. But she went to the tomb, bless her heart. But it was open that day. There wasn't nobody in there. She thought somebody stole him. And she looked at a man who she thought was the gardener and said, if you've taken him away, tell me where you've laid him and I'll go get him and take him. And he said, Mary. And she went, Rabboni. Oh, can you imagine? That happened to a woman. This isn't a movie. A woman that watched him die, that never left his side, that watched them wrap him from head to toe and put him in there. I know it seems like speculation, but probably had to drag her out while they closed the tomb. Crying and shaking and he's gone. The best thing that ever was. And he's dead. A couple days later, he's standing in front of her and says, Mary. (laughs) That'll rock you. And people say, calm down, brother. You're so wrong. You're, you're way wrong. Tell Mary to calm down. Tell Mary to chill. 
She's been loved by him and delivered by him. She's been touched by him. And he's, he, I don't know why she didn't recognize him. I don't know how he appeared. I don't know why that is. I, I just know when he said Mary, she saw him. Now, you know, she's running to him. She's going, man. Now, that could have been a good movie scene. She's, Rap pony. But Jesus didn't let her act it out. He said, don't cling to me. Why? Best thing's coming. This thing ain't a wrap yet. The beating necessary, it's finished. They didn't have to whack me no more. I paid the price for your redemption, but the best part's coming. I'm up from the dead now. I got to take my blood up to the Father, take it into the holy place, the heavenly tabernacle, and put my blood on the mercy seat and make peace between God and man and crush sin forever. Amen. That's, what, that's why he didn't want her clinging. He's not unsocial. It's not, it, the best thing's coming. Who knows he could have sat with her all day. He's love. He could have sat there in fellowship with Mary and told her all about it. And she would have just, oh, right? But he said, don't cling to me. She's probably in midair, diving, coming. Oh. He probably, don't cling to me. Oh. I hope somebody went and got her. She might still be there. Don't cling to me, Mary. I haven't yet ascended to the Father. But go tell my disciples. These guys that didn't do anything right, that said they'd all die for him and ran as soon as he was apprehended. These guys that said they'd never deny him and they all denied him. One just Peter, one man ran through the trees. They tried to grab him. He ran so hard to get away. He ran out of his clothes. They shredded his clothes off of him in his attempt to get away. And he ran through the trees streaking, naked. Now, I'm not the brightest man on the planet, but if you run out of your clothes, you're trying to get away. And back at the supper table, they're all going to die for him. Hands down, believed it too. Until they had the chance. And they loved their own life. And that fear of man and fear of death rose up that every man's in bondage to until Christ. Can't blame them. They're in bondage, that fear of death. They begin to love their own life. Even though they loved him, the best they understood, they loved their own lives just a little bit more. And they took off running. Jesus said, go tell my brethren. Most beautiful thing. Don't miss that stuff in your Bible. Don't read so fast. Slow down and get it. Because he didn't say, go tell my low life, two faced, backstabbing, undependable, untrustworthy group of. Come on. You go tell my brethren. That's a covenant term, it's a family term. What he's saying is, I haven't changed my mind about you, no matter what you've done. Bam! Ain't that something? He's saying that to you, he's saying that to me. Saying that to everybody because it's his goodness that changes us, not his reprimand. Most of us already know better. We've just been struggling. We don't have a good view of ourselves. We're just fighting. We're in war. We do things and cry and try to get it right and feel like mess. <laughs> He's coming to bring the best out in you, not beat you down. Go tell my. <laughs> I'm ascending to my father and. Look up the word father. It means to come forth from in that chapter. I'm going to my father and your father. I'm going to the one I came forth from. I'm going to the one you came forth from. Amen. He's responsible for your life. You came forth from him. He fathered you. <laughs> Well, I can't relate. I never had a loving father. Yes, you did. Call no man on earth your father. Matthew 3, 23, 9. You have one father. And he's in heaven. That doesn't mean you disregard your biological dad, but you don't let your biological dad limit, regulate, and identify your life, especially if it was a negative experience. Don't hate him. Don't regret. Don't try to buy lost time. Just look to the one that you came forth from. Because if it wasn't for him, you wouldn't be here. You wouldn't even have a biological dad. If it wasn't for the author giver of life, there would have been no seed. There would have been no egg. There would be no you. 
<laughs> but there was seed and there was egg. Even if you don't know who gave the seed or the egg, you have a father and life comes from God. You came forth from him. <laughs> yeah, but I don't know my mom. I don't know my dad. I don't know who he was. My mom was using drugs. She slept with many men. I have no clue, and I don't even know who she was. I just one day was told that my mom died right after I was born, and I never even knew her, and she didn't even know who the daddy was, so I don't even know either one. Well, you can rest assured that if he's the author and giver of life, and you're here, and there's a time to be born, your life is the will of God, and you're right on time. Amen. Come on. Or you can wrap your identity around all that stuff, and you can take a hit and believe a lie and give yourself a reason to not be okay when you have every reason to shine because you're here. Somebody stepped in, something worked out. <laughs> somebody could, man, I know this sounds extreme, but somebody could find you under a bush wrapped up in crime with the umbilical cord hanging and still all messy up. And that mama was scared and she had her and she had a drug addiction. She just had you there in a park and cried and screamed and gave birth to you and took off running. And somebody come along and picked you out of there and fell in love with you and got the courts to agree. And all of a sudden there you're, you're daddy and mom and you find out how many years later how you were found. And all of a sudden people get this vacuum and who's my real mom and I can't believe she didn't want me. Are you kidding me? God had his hand on you. Somebody wanted you. They picked you up from under the bush and said you're worthy. Why would you limit your life by a confused woman? Why would you identify with somebody that's a dry cup? If you're a dry cup, there's nothing to give. That's why you're thirsty. You're trying to drink out of things that are dry. You guys good? I feel the gospel tonight. We're going to have fun tonight, okay? But I'm going to my, I feel the gospel actually every day, so I don't know why I said that, but I feel it tonight, just so you know. <laughs> Sorry. I'm in trouble, Tom. Pray for me. Don't get nervous. Pray. <laughs> I'm going to my father and I'm going to my God and do you see what he's doing? He's making them one. The word God there means source of life. I'm going to the one that I came from and you came from and he's our source of life. So when you call God, Father God, just know this. You're saying, I came forth from the source of life. So Father God's a cool phrase. It's not Christianese. And Father God, I just thank you, Father God, that Father God, you uh, are amazing, Father God, and I just pray, Father God, and believe, Father God. And we throw like 25 Father Gods into four Christian words. It's just, I'm just saying, I'm not against that. I'm not making fun of nobody. What I'm saying is it's not Christianese. It means something amazing. Stand in your bedroom and say, Father God, and know that you're saying every time you say it, I came forth from the source of life. And never again believe you're an accident, you're a happenstance, you're born out of due season. Understand that your time has come, your life is the will of God, and you're here on purpose. <laughs> Come on. Or he would have never died and shed his blood to redeem your life if your life wasn't worth something in him. But then we let life beat us down and circumstances and people and relationships and things. And all of a sudden we start finding our value and losing our value all along the way. And we let other things matter more than what matters most. You find yourself in him. Period. I'm telling you what. Very young, very young age. It's not long in. Very young age. You start losing your innocence. Get hurt a little. Start getting a little self-conscious. Start understanding some things. A little loss of innocence. And Yeah? Not very long into life, you start becoming a product of whatever you're going through and how you're responding. So you become nothing more than how it went down and you're a product of how you reacted to how it went down. That's bondage. That's a lie. That's nobody's truth in this room. Come on, you let someone hurt you at age eight and it could dictate your life for 12 more years and you're living something for 12 years because you're carrying pain and it's not even you, it's your response to pain. And then it involves this need and that need and this craving and that because you're trying to find something that you can only find in him. And he's not here. 
He's not just here to mend those things and fill those gaps. He's here to teach you who you are and fill you with Him. Like He wants to make things new, not patch things up. He's not the fixer up it guy. He's not, he's definitely, he's not using duct tape on your life. <laughs> as amazing as it is, thank God for duct tape. <laughs> but he's not here to duct tape your life. <laughs> he's here to restore it and make it brand new. Yeah? So in that chapter, I want to get to the point, and I just, it's such a good chapter, there's so much to preach out. I just wanted to get right to the point. I didn't know I was going to preach the whole story out. Jesus walks in the room. He says to his disciples who ran and denied and wept bitterly and were in a fear moment when he walked in the room. Would you agree that the Bible agrees that when he walked in the room, they're in fear for their lives? He walks in the room and says, peace to you. Why does he say peace to you? He just came from making peace. He just put his blood on the mercy seat. You say, how do you know he did that? It doesn't say that. It says that if you look. If you look, I'll explain. He put his blood on the mercy seat. He said, I haven't yet ascended to the Father. Same day in the evening, he came back. Why did he go to see the Father? He went to be a high priest between God and men. He went to walk through the priestly ritual and rule. He walked in there with his own blood, not the blood of bulls and goats. And when it was all done and he walked through the process, he applied his blood on the mercy seat of heaven, the blood of a man. Capital M-A-N. Don't get offended by that because it's true. Not the blood of God, the blood of a man. You see, yeah, but he was 100% God and 100% man. That's why I hear people say all the time because they feel like they have to defend that aspect. He called himself the son of man because he wants you to know he came as a man. Empowered by the spirit. Because if not, you can't follow him. Can God be tempted? Can God be tempted? God can't be tempted. So Jesus is the Son of God. He's God the Son. So is Jesus God? He's answer questions. He can, don't be afraid to answer. Everybody's like, Come on, I ain't saying a word, dude. Everybody's looking at me. I'm not setting you up. I don't even have that in me. Watch this. So if Jesus came as God, how's he tempted at all points? He came as a man. How in Acts 10, 38 would God have to anoint Jesus of Nazareth, manhood, Jesus of Nazareth, why would God have to anoint God? Wouldn't God be anointed? How God anointed Jesus of, with the Holy Spirit and power who went around doing. Does God slumber? Does he sleep? Where was Jesus in the boat? <laughs> Ain't that something? I bet he came as a man. That's right. Caught him sleeping. He was a man. Paul writes to Timothy, Timothy, there's one that mediates between God and man. One who mediates and goes between God and man, and he's the man. The man. Bingo, the man, capital M, A. He wants you to know he's still a man, representing men before God, giving you total access as a human being to go before God and enter into his presence through his blood, speaking better things. It's so powerful. Yeah? yeah? One man. The man. When he rose from the dead in Matthew, uh, I think it's Matthew 28, I think, he said, touch me for a spirit. Don't be afraid. Touch me for a spirit doesn't have flesh and bone as I. Right. He's trying to let us know he's still a man. Put his name above every name. King of kings and Lord of lords, and every knee is going to bow. Like Jesus is all that. Yeah. 
<laughs> but he's flesh and bone. Why? Because he's trying to let us know that a man is sitting at the right hand of God forever, mediating on behalf of men, and his love will never fail. Are you, are you hearing? And he rules his kingdom with a scepter called righteousness. So what's he do? He comes in and he says, peace be to you. And they look and go, whoa, is that who we think it is? Well, come on, we'd all been freaked out. You're afraid for your life. You're sure he's dead. That's why you're afraid for your life. Your hope's gone. He ain't around. You don't even know what to do. And you turn and he's standing there. Ah! And he says, touch me. And they feel his hands. They feel his side. And it says they were glad. They realized it was the Lord and they were glad. They were like, oh my goodness, it's you. What's the first thing that hits him when they realize is it's really him? We ran, we denied you, and we didn't do one thing we said we'd do. Because the very next thing out of his mouth when they recognized it was the Lord, he already said peace to you. What's the next thing he said out of his mouth when they realized it was the Lord, the next sentence? Peace be unto you. It's not the same peace as the first time. The first peace is... I made peace between man and God. Peace be unto you. The war is over. Sin is crushed. I'm the lamb that's taken it away. I haven't covered it. I've taken it away in its power, right? Do we still have to repent? Do we still take accountability for our lives? Do we still have to walk out in faith? Yeah? If you find yourself in weakness, if you find yourself in something outside of the moral nature and character of God, is it good to get that thing clean and get alone with God and confess your faults even one to another sometimes and just get real with it and pray for one another? You better believe it. You'll walk this thing out, but He makes us clean. So He says, peace to you. And He shows Him His hands inside and then He says, peace to you the second time. What's the second peace? He's saying, relax. I know how you're feeling right now. I haven't changed my mind. I don't feel failed by you. You get it? It's so amazing. Yeah. So then he does something spectacular in John 20. He breathes on them. He says, as the Father sent me, so I... So he says, peace be unto you. Second peace, chill, relax, stop feeling guilty. Stop feeling bad. Peace be to you. As the Father sent me. Find a limitation for me in this. As the Father sent me, so I send you. You can't even say, well, he's talking to the disciples, not us. No, because in Matthew 28, he told the disciples to go make disciples of all nations, teaching them to observe everything he taught them. So if he's talking to Peter, James, and John, he's talking to you and me. Let's just get that settled. He says, peace be unto you, as the Father sent me, so I send you. And then he does something remarkable. He breathes on them and says, receive the Holy Spirit. Isn't that amazing? What's he doing? He's taking them back. No, that's coming in Acts 2. They're born again. When he breathes on them, life's coming back into them. They're not tares anymore. They're wheat. They're not a throwaway. They're a keeper fish. They're becoming the children of God in that breath. Why? Because he's the redeemer of man. He makes things new. Redemption means brought back to original value. So how did God make man in the beginning? And when he breathed on him, man became a living. So when Adam sinned, it died. And man lived in a shadow of what he was here for. And when Jesus put his blood on the mercy seat, he came back and said, hey, we can go back to the garden again. We can start over. I got blood speaking better things, and it's my blood, and it's pure. And I'm going to breathe into them if, if sin never happened, and they're going to live again. <sighs> Receive Holy Spirit. And man became a living being. Wow. <laughs> yeah? <laughs> Watch. As if sin never happened. The blood's that amazing. Now the tree's still there and the lie's still there and the whispers are still there, but you still have the commandment to follow him. Come on. 
Tree's still there. Voice still whispers. Follow him. Nothing's changed except that Jesus came and took away sin and made us alive again. Yeah. When you said he empowered him, he does empower us through the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That's a whole nother experience scripturally. Because you don't tell them in John 20, receive Holy Spirit and believe Holy Spirit didn't come. Right. And then tell them in Luke 24 to tarry in the city and Holy Spirit's come and the promise of the Father and empower you to be a witness. Two different things. One's a well springing up into everlasting life. The other one's a river flowing out of your belly. Two totally different things. Acts 8, they were only baptized in the name of the Lord, were baptized. The disciples traveled 35 to 50 miles to lay their hands on them, so the Holy Spirit hadn't come upon any yet. And when they laid their hands upon them, bam, he came. People fight over this. It's the age-long argument. It's amazing how we fight over some of the most critical doctrines of the Lord. And we fight over them and get in adversity and animosity and miss the glory and power and revelation and fruitfulness of these things. And all of a sudden we stand in our position of rightness and miss the expression of him in the process. <laughs> we say, well, you get the Holy Spirit when you're born again. You get life inside of you. You get a recreated spirit. Your spirit comes alive. You were dead a minute ago. Now you're alive. He <sighs> breathes life into you. But tarry in the city and the promise of the Father will come. Watch this. If we being of evil nature, Luke 11, know how to give good gifts to our children, how much more the Father will give Holy Spirit to them who, if He's automatic when you get saved, why do you have to ask? Why did Peter, James, or Peter and John have to travel 35 to 50 miles to lay hands on them because He had come upon none of them yet? Why when Paul is walking down the road in Ephesus in Acts 19, he recognizes some disciples because of their outer garments and wear, and he can tell they're following something. And he says, hey guys, his first question, he didn't say nice day, isn't it? He said, hey guys, have you received Holy Spirit since you believed? They said, well, we haven't even heard if there is a Holy Spirit. He said, what? Where are you guys from? What are you following? We're following John's baptism. He said, oh my goodness, that's the baptism of repentance. He was preaching the one that was to come. Don't you know he already came? He's Jesus. And having heard this, they got born again and they were all baptized in the name of the Lord. That means water. And then when Paul laid his hands on them, Holy Spirit came upon them all and they all spoke in tongues and prophesied one minute old in the Lord. Whoa. Two separate experiences. John 4, well springing up, everlasting life. John 7, river flowing out. Would you agree there's a difference between a well springing up and a river pouring out of your belly? It's just simple. There's other scriptures too, but it makes it pretty clear. But anyway, I'm trying to cover something here that, that there's righteousness. Mark got up here and he said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, man. I... I want us to hunger and thirst for righteousness because of what he said in that chapter, right? Blessed is he. He shall be filled. Filled with right, what? Filled with the right revelation and identity of how God sees him and filled with the right expression through that truth. Righteousness makes the difference. When you see that you're right with God, you wake up every day without shame. You stop striving. You're done trying to be a Christian. You're done trying not to sin. You wake up and enjoy being His, and that empowers you to live differently. Are you following me? Come on, it's simple gospel. It's called living by faith. Not letting your experience trick you into saying, oh yeah, but brother, stop that. We're following Jesus. We're not following our past practice. We're not following the greater populace. We're following Jesus. So every day you wake up, what do you do? You wear your robe of righteousness. You put on your garment of righteousness. You're dressed. You're ready. Yeah? You're a tree. The planning of the Lord. It's all His desire. It's all His idea. So a righteous tree eats seed after its own kind. What fruit would a righteous tree produce? Righteousness. Why do you live in righteousness, brother? Because I'm a righteous tree. Why do you produce righteous fruit? Because I'm a righteous tree. Each tree after its own kind. You bear much fruit. Then he's going to prune you and you're going to bear more. Wow. 
Here's what we get tricked into. Sincere people, not hypocrites, sincere people get tricked into trying to produce fruit and try to bear more fruit and try to, yeah, instead of just be a good tree. If you accept what the blood says about you, the fruit will hang on the tree. Like you don't do to prove that you are. You become to be empowered to do. It's totally backwards from works and legalism and the way we were all brought up. You've got to start where he finished if you're going to run well. You've got to believe what the blood's saying about you now so you can bear the fruit of righteousness then. Are you with me? Or in good, sincere thinking and wrong believing, you'll try to, you'll try to accomplish something that he already conquered. I'll try to explain it this way so you can get this. I don't have any knowledge of any day in 22 years of Christian living. Not one trace of knowledge. It's not because I'm in denial or forgot. I, I don't have one knowledge of waking up and trying harder, trying to live better, trying to live the Christian life, or trying not to sin. That's foreign language. I don't even know what that is. Because it's not in that book. What's in that book is waking up in righteousness. You wake up in right standing. You reckon yourself dead to sin and alive unto God, accepted in the beloved, holy, blameless, above reproach in His sight. He writes to the saints, not those who are about to miss it. It's not humility. It's false humility when you're always conscious of sin and have a language that always talks about your ability to fail any moment. That is not where you find the righteousness of God. It's not humility. It's false humility. You're not receiving what the blood is saying about you, so you're not going to receive the grace that empowers you to live different. There's a deception in it. Well, brother, we're always going to sin. You know how we feel compelled to have to say, well, what are you saying, brother? Are you perfect? Nobody's saying that. I'm not even thinking sin right now. Why does that always pop up? The Christian is to have no more consciousness of sin. I can show you that in Scripture. How do you reckon yourself dead to sin and then think you're humbly confessing your ability to commit it? How do you reckon yourself to sin, dead to sin, and then keep it in your conversation? So as soon as somebody starts preaching like this, teachers of the word. Oh, that's a little, uh, he's going off now. Everybody sins, man. We're not perfect. And it's because they're conscious of sin, and it's their own testimony. And then when I say something like that, people go, oh, he's saying he never sins. I'm saying I never think about it and I never let it dictate my day. And if I would bump into it, I'd be aware of it immediately in my relationship with God. And I would run to him, never run from him. And I would never get naked and ashamed. I would sit on his lap and become wiser and sharper and, and clearer than ever before. Amen. Yeah? Amen. Never run from him. Never get caught in denial. Never just get caught in a language that doesn't bring redemption. Yeah? Because he didn't cover our sin. He took it away. Huh. Okay, so he's the Lamb of God who... So he took it away. So now what? I guess we should stop talking about it and be sons and daughters and be clean and be free and be blameless. Yeah. Come on, he took it away. Yeah. Or are we believers? Or do we believe our past practice? And is our wrong identity and our wrong thinking producing wrong fruit so the wrong fruit keeps us in the lie because it proves what we're saying? So we say, yeah, brother, but we're always going to sin. Then when you do, you don't have a strong conviction because it's who we are. It's amazing. He loves us, you know. It's a wonder he considers us. And then your life stays the same and your fruit continues to affirm the wrong believing. And the wrong believing keeps producing the same fruit. And it's a vicious cycle that doesn't produce life. So then we have to come up to a, with a theology to protect, protect our dilemma. You guys okay? Do you know why we pray for the sick? Some people think we pray for the sick because they're sick. And that sounds legitimate to me, but 
The reason we're supposed to be inspired to pray, because you don't pray for the sick because of their need. You pray for the sick because of faith, and faith works through love. If you don't understand the gospel, you don't even have a, a solid platform to really pray for the sick and actually believe and expect God to move. We're supposed to see something. You pray for the sick because of the forgiveness of sins. It's a form of redemption. The, the healing of the sick is a fruit of redemption through forgiveness. By his stripes, we're healed. If he sees us through his blood as if we've never sinned, then the fruits and effect of sin must be challenged, must be rebuked, must be removed. So we're inspired to pray for the sick because of the forgiveness of sins, not because they're sick. <laughs> Not because they're hurting and haven't slept for three weeks. I get all that and it feels and moves and ooh and ooh. And it just, uh, but how much is that working? You're getting all worked up and them crying and you, you know, hey, this is going to come out of you, God. And then you get in a quandary and where are you at, God? And what are we doing wrong? And I thought you loved us. Oh, come on. When it comes to praying for the sick, those things are rampant in our lives. So some of us just backed out and we don't even touch it anymore. Some of us don't even pray for the sick because we're afraid nothing will happen. So we get what we're afraid of by not praying. Wow. You guys okay? Are you sure? Yeah. It'd be a shame I feel this good and you're not all right. I hope you're okay. I'm just checking in. We're inspired to pray. Oh my goodness, yes, I'll do it. <laughs> that was the Lord, I promise. <laughs> Luke 24. I just heard the Lord say, give him Luke 24. I was like, okay, that's good. <laughs> Verse 44. Jesus is raised from the dead. He's talking to his disciples. Luke 24, verse 44. He says, these are the words which I spoke to you while I was with you that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. Watch, this is beautiful. I saw this when I got saved. I said, man, if you did that for them, you'll do that for me. He opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. I've met countless people who say, well, I don't hardly read my Bible because I don't understand it. And they're frustrated. I try to read my Bible and I don't get it. Man, sit with your Bible in your lap and commune with God and thank Him for grace and thank Him for... Stop getting frustrated. It's never produced one good thing in your life. Stop believing it's okay. Frustration's not okay. The wrath of man never produces the righteousness of God and He rules His kingdom with the thing that... Anger and frustration and wrath never produces. The wrath of man never produces the righteousness of God. So Jesus rules his kingdom with a scepter that wrath never produces. Isn't it amazing how easy it is to get angry and frustrated when you don't understand things? Isn't it amazing how intolerable we can get and how we can get pushed and we got these little buttons and wires and things and we just, poof, well, they pushed me too far. Well, what do you expect? Well, how would you have felt? Well, I just couldn't take it anymore. I'm just mad. Sometimes you're mad at yourself and wrath towards yourself doesn't produce righteousness. You see the trap? Ain't that something? Watch this. It's amazing. He opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. Now watch what he said. Watch what he said. And, and, and I'm not criticizing anybody. It's just my experience in life and the years I've been on the earth and the time I've been saved. And I've noticed something when I read this stuff. I'm like, isn't it amazing how Jesus said some of this vital stuff. And when you look at the church, us at large, the things are almost twisted backwards or so misrepresented. And there's some of the vital things that he said. The signs of a believer. <laughs> We're going to cast out devils. We're going to speak in new tongues. Well, that right there is trouble in the camp. <laughs> well, tongues ain't from today, for today, and it's of the devil, and ain't no such thing as baptism of the Holy Spirit, and you get the Holy Spirit when you're born again, so now you're building camps and rivers and streams and separating and segregating. And then you're mad, and everybody who doesn't believe what you do, do believe is probably going to hell, and is it false, and a wolf in sheep's clothing, and the devil himself. It's amazing 
How we have such liberty to cast our opinion in the season we live in. How even social media gives people a chance to just voice their opinion without any accountability, without any thought. Just listen to a fellow like me. Don't even know me. Look, you can say whatever you want about me. It's okay. Nobody can stop me from knowing him, loving him, being loved by him. And I'm not saying that arrogantly. I'm going to lay on that bed that Mike and Robin so preciously gave me tonight. And there ain't nobody on this planet that can keep him from me. Like, I'm going to lay there, and he's going to talk to me and love on me. And I'm going to wake up, and he's going to be right there. Man, I've already won. Amen. You can write anything derogatory you want, but you ain't walking in my shoes. You ain't enjoying him, or you couldn't be writing that stuff because you'd think different. You'd cry for me. You'd hurt for me, and you'd pray for me if you really believed what you were writing. That's right. You wouldn't criticize and judge and step out of bounds and play God because that's not your calling. <laughs> it's just amazing how people criticize each other. They're just in the Christian camp, man. Well, I don't agree with that. Well, he's a heretic. Well, he's a false prophet. Well, he's this, he's that, he's that. You better be really, really careful. One day you're going to stand before God and find out you might not have known him a fraction of what those people you're writing about knew. Yeah. And all you had was an opinion and maybe not a lot of fruit. <sighs> oh, man. It's just good to be able to talk like that and know where your heart's coming from. Yeah. I mean, that's not, <laughs> you have no idea how cool I have to try to play it after I talk like that because I feel so wired right now because what I'm saying, nobody can keep me from him. Amen. Ah! <laughs> He's going to slip up on me. Love you. Some of the people that are, they're so frustrated in their own Christian life, they're so bound by theology, they ain't even having that experience. So when you have that experience, they didn't have it. They don't think it can be real. So I must be hearing the devil. Just think how dangerous it is when all you want to do is blow a trumpet. Well, God doesn't heal today. Healing's not for today. That means everybody that shares a healing testimony is deceived, lying, or of the devil. That's not a good camp to be in. To call everybody that has a healing testimony deceived, a liar, or of the devil. That's what they did to Jesus and crucified him on a cross. But God raised him from the dead and gave him a name above every name. Amen. <laughs> see, he didn't let what men didn't see determine what he did see. He's the light of the world. He's cast in the light here. Yeah? Sure. Man, I'm telling you, confidence isn't pride. And there's something you can have in your relationship with God is a confidence that you know what makes you tick. You know why you say what you say. You know why you travel. You know why you preach. And you know why. And people can say anything they want about it. But when you know why, it gives you boldness and confidence. There was a time when Peter and John didn't understand that. And then there was a time when them Pharisees looked at them and they weren't afraid anymore. And they weren't scared to die anymore. And they counted it an honor to be treated like Jesus and be suffering for his namesake. And they were flogged and came out rejoicing. And they said, whether it's right in the sight of God to listen to you or listen to God, you're going to have to decide in this matter since you're trying to rule this thing. But we can't help but to speak of what we've seen and what we've heard. Right? So there's a place where they just changed. <laughs> And then because you don't agree with their theology, you're going to call them false prophets. You better be careful. I've said to people a long time ago, if you disagree with what somebody's saying, stop getting mad and think you're this watchman on the wall that's supposed to be angry and mad and, and tell everybody, stay away, that's a liar. He's this, he's that. If you were really close to God, you would cry about those things, not get mad about them. And they would bring you to weeping. And blessed are those who mourn in Zion. Not criticize, for they shall be comforted. Man, I would hope if you really thought I was that off track, that you'd love me enough in Jesus to cry for me and pray that I'd come to the light of truth, not cut me down with your words. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> And I'm not saying that because actually people don't, that to my knowledge, don't write a ton of bad stuff about me. I mean, I don't start whoever's listening just because I said that. <laughs> but my buddies actually told me, they said, you don't have a ton of persecution out there. I said, well, it's good if somebody throws one in now and then because be careful if every man speaks well of you. So. <laughs> <laughs> but like I said, my buddy Todd, he just gets hammered all the time. 
I mean, the, the dude could just wear long hair and, and, and braid it up and it shows how shallow we are and all of a sudden he's of the devil because of the way he looks. That's so self-righteous, it's troubling. <laughs> oh God, have mercy. I'll get off of that. I'll come back here. <clears throat> oh, and it's still here. Watch this. It hasn't left. Then he said to them, Thus, verse 46, thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. Now watch, why, why, why? So we can go to heaven, brother, watch. That repentance, don't let anybody teach you that salvation comes apart from repentance and that everybody's okay and everybody's already in, they just don't know it. Don't let anybody deceive you. It's been repent from the time John cried out. It was repent in the Old Testament. Yeah. Repent. Change the way you think. God's kingdom's here. Repentance. Wow, I've been living for me. Wow, I've been very self-centered in my life. Wow, my heart's been a mess. I've been angry, frustrated, judgmental. Wow, man, I haven't been producing the fruit of God. Wow, time to turn. Time to live for your kingdom and seek you first. Wow, it's time to stop loving my own life. Time to give myself back to you. It's repentance. Repentance can be as simple as somebody preaching. You go, Duh. oh my God, yes. It's not boo-hoo, I'm sorry. It's wow, I see different. Repentance isn't, oh, it can, it can have tears. But if it has tears, to be true repentance, it has to have change of mind. Bill Johnson has an amazing definition for repent. Re, recycle, the little prefix, rehabilitate, recycle, re to redo, to run it through again, to reprocess it through. Pent, top floor of a high-rise building. Repent, rethink from the highest view. It's pretty cool. I like it. I think it's neat. You say, well, I don't like Bill Johnson. Well, think about what he said. That's pretty profound. <laughs> you don't have to like him. <laughs> I actually felt that in the room when I said his name. I don't know why. I don't know who's here, but somebody, I felt like somebody didn't like Bill Johnson. So here's the deal. I love him too. I don't listen a lot because I don't listen to a lot of people, but the little bit I've listened, I'm thinking, wow, rethink from the highest view. Repent, my kingdom's here. Repent for the kingdom of God is here. Change the way you think because I'm here and it ain't the way you think. He spends a whole chapter saying, you say, but I say, you say, but I say. If he takes a whole chapter to say, you say, but I say, he's probably saying, you ain't saying what I'm saying. <laughs> and if he's Lord, we probably ought to change what we're saying to line up to what he's saying. <laughs> that repentance, here's why he suffered, here's why he died. Here's that repentance, watch this and remission of sins. That's removal. Remission, removal. That repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations, beginning right here at Jerusalem. And you're a witness to these things. What's the purpose? Repentance and removal of sin. What have we done? Say you're sorry, people cry, no sense of change. Hey, you're always gonna sin, nobody's perfect. Thank God he loves you. Yep. Do your best, you're always gonna fail, but try harder. <laughs> Come on, when I grew up in the church, they said Jesus died on the cross because I was a sinner. That's what I was told my whole life. And I realized when I read my Bible, that's not why he died. He had to die because I sinned. He didn't die on the cross because I'm a sinner. He died on the cross because I was a lost son. He died on the cross to redeem what was lost, to restore what was lost. He died on the cross to take away the lie so I could walk in the truth. <laughs> he didn't die on the cross because I was a sinner. If you believe that, it leaves you a forgiven sinner. And now you're confused and wonder why he'd even love you because you're a sinner. <laughs> He doesn't write to the sinners of Colossae, to the sinners of Ephesus, yeah. to those about to fail before lunchtime. Yeah. That's right. 
Let's get the language out of our lives. Let's stop letting our experience dictate what we believe and get back to following him. I'm going to prove this to you. Hey, this is last minute. Where's my people? Where are they? This is big place, man. Are they up there? Them lights are bright. Can somebody, who's working that, that thing? Is there anybody that can or help me? If not, they don't, we don't have to. Somebody's going. Are you going up there? Listen, let me ask you a question before you run the whole way up there and get stair stepper exercise. Can you put scripture up there for me? Oh my goodness. Can you get new King James Version? You're my hero. <laughs> I got two saviors now in my life, but Jesus is number one. You don't have to run, dude. This dude is laying down his life. He's running. Can you put new King James Version? Oh my. This has to be the Lord. I just like New King James because it's not the thou shouts and wilt nots. It's, I don't talk Elizabeth in English. It actually sounds strange to me. My pastor loves King James. And some people go extreme. Well, if it ain't King James, it ain't the Bible at all. And I'm thinking, why? King James is an original text. Why are you building up that? What? So you say the same thing that King James says. You just don't say thou shouts and wilt nots because I don't talk that way. Yeah? yeah. So, let's look at 1 John 5. I don't know if I did this when I was here before. It doesn't matter. We're doing it, man. It's in my heart. It's Mark's fault. If it don't work, Mark. <laughs> if we hunger and thirst for righteousness, that means right standing with God. The Bible says in Colossians 1 that you and I were alienated and enemies to God by the wicked way our minds were. He's not always talking about robbery and murder and theft when he says the wicked way your minds work. Watch this. If you just think for yourself, if you just love the things of the world, the love of God isn't in you. You don't know the love of God. If you love the things of the world, the love of the Father is not in you, right? Well, we're going to go to uh, uh, 1 John 1. We'll start in verse 5. 1 John 1, and we'll start in verse 5. So... So watch this. You and I were alienated. We were enemies to God. That's, this is, he's got putting First John up there. Just forget that for a minute. I think you're looking at angels or something. You're all looking above me. <laughs> I'm talking about Colossians 1 right now. We're going up there. But watch this. You and me, we were both alienated and enemies to God by the way our minds work. We were all living for ourselves, but we were created for his image. We were all self-seeking. We weren't pursuing love. We were seeking, seeking ourself. Self-satisfaction. Self-pleasure, self-gratification, self-defense, self-protection, self-justification. Come on, guys, it's the biggest lie on the planet. The biggest problem on the planet is not politics, it's not terrorism. The biggest problem on the planet is men living for themselves when they're made for his image. Yeah. Yeah. Biggest problem. But we have so many people because they're living for themselves with their own right, their own attitude, well, it's my life, freedom of choice, da-da-da. Friend, it was never your life. It was always his life in you. That's the connection. It's his life in you. That's the only way you're ever going to live free. Life's a grind and a challenge and life's blank. Whatever you put in there, make sure it's cool. Life blank. You know, life's tough. Life's a grind. Life's, life's a challenge. It ain't easy, brother. People that talk like that, they don't understand what they're letting happen. They're living their life outside of why they're here. So there's no grace. So they're surviving. And then they get tricked into trying to bring God into their life, hoping for a better one instead of a new one. Are you with me? First yes. John chapter 1, verse 5. Thank you. Oh, man, this is great. You got the whole thing up there. Dude, you have no idea how I appreciate you leaping up and running up there like that. Thank you. This is good. This is going to be good. Who's ever heard people say... Well, brother, if we say, when you talk about living free from sin and wrecking yourself dead, yeah, but brother, if we don't say, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, we make him a liar. Right. We deceive ourselves and the truth's not in us. Who's ever heard people quote that one liner? As if we always have the guilt of sin, the awareness of sin. How can Jesus breathe into us and how can Holy Spirit move inside of us and how can he reestablish his covenant and take us back to Genesis 1 if sin's still upon you? He rules his kingdom with a scepter of righteousness. You were alienated in enemies by the wicked way your minds worked, yet now he reconciled you through the death of Jesus Christ, through his body of death 
and presented you holy, blameless, and above reproach in his sight. That's scripture. It's not my sermon. If indeed you continue believing it, continue in the hope in which you heard and aren't moved away from that gospel, meaning that you continue to believe that and don't let anything change your mind. Yeah, but brother, I ain't feeling so holy. Well, you don't know, man. I struggled yesterday. Well, you don't know how that made me feel. Well, I just don't feel close to God. Since when were we called to get up and live by how we feel and make that the truth? Well, I don't feel like God loves me. I just need a touch from the love of God. Will you pray for me that I feel the love of God? Not at all. Nope, I won't. I'll pray that you believe the love of God. That's your strongest blessing. You believe the love of God because he sent his son. He might actually give you a stewardship of the experience of his love when you believe his love. God loves you too much just to tickle your cheek now and then. Yeah, you don't live as a concubine, people. You don't get called into the presence of the king now and then. Come on. How many people are in here, man? I don't know. There's a big place, but there's people spread out everywhere. I don't know. There's a few hundred people. Let's just say, is there 250? Is there 300? What is there? I don't know. Three out of 400. Is there 400? Okay. Guys, I'm not being rude or crude. He doesn't have 400 concubines. We're not supposed to come and hope he calls our name tonight and brushes up against us. <laughs> and we just spend a night with the king and don't know when he'll call our name again because there is 400 of us. <laughs> You're called to be the queen. You're supposed to be in him and with him. Yeah. Like it's your name every day, every night. Oh. You're not living for a goosebump. You're loved by God. You're not living for an encounter. He's inside of you. It's time we all start believing that. And that he did something about sin evicted him from his home. Living in you. So he did something about it. So he could move back in. Guys, don't let life make your heart hard. Don't think for yourself. Don't hear a gospel this powerful and then misunderstand and let something else steal it away. Today is not the day to have a bad attitude. Today is not the day to be mad at God or mad at people or frustrated. I promise yesterday wasn't either. But we can't do much about yesterday. But we can sure talk about today. And not even think about tomorrow. It has enough of its own. Let's just get things lined up today and then tomorrow will make more sense. Yeah. Don't get ahead of yourself. Today has enough of its own. Oh, man, this is good preaching. I'm glad you let me come. Talk. <laughs> if we say we have fellowship, co-union, communion, and koinonia with God, koinonia. If we say that we're one with God and we walk with God and he's in us and we're in him and we walk in darkness, we're lying. We're not practicing the truth. But if we walk in the light as he's in the light we have fellowship with one another so you're coming out of darkness into light and the blood of jesus christ his son cleanseth us from how much sin so in that verse you've just been cleansed from so do you have any sin right now if you're walking in the light, if you come out of darkness in the light and say, man, I've lived for myself. I've lived on holy. I've lived on man. I've lived in rebellion. God, would you wash me? Forgive me. I just ask you to receive me and make me clean and forgive me of all my sin. Jesus, you're my Lord. You're my savior. I believe you died on the cross. Right? Yeah. Somebody gets touched in their heart and realizes they need change and salvation and they cry out to God. Does the Bible say he comes and the blood of his son cleanseth you of what? How much? So is there any left? Okay. So he's talking about needing the blood of Jesus to be cleansed. If we say we have no sin, he just told you you're cleansed from all sin if you, if you call on the blood. If we have no sin, what he's saying is if we say, if you say you have no need for the blood, right. well, I'm a pretty good person. He's talking about the lie of self righteousness. He's talking about you saying, well, why is the cross? Well, I don't hurt people, I don't do bad things. I don't lie and cheat and steal. I'm, I don't. You know there's people out there that do that. You know Paul talked about that. 
He's saying, if you say you have no sin, if you say you have no need for this process, no need for this blood, you're deceived and the truth isn't in you. But if you confess your sin, we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We all need redemption. We all need mercy. We all need forgiveness. We're not saying we've never sinned, but at the same time, we're not quick to say, well, we just sinned a minute ago. <laughs> oh, I'll make it clear. It'll be so clear. You ain't going to be able to. If we confess our sins, he is. Whew, thank God you're faithful. And just to what? Oh, this is good. Verse 7, you were cleansed of how much sin? Oh, my goodness. Verse 9, you're forgiven of what sin? Our sin. And he will cleanse us from somewhat our unrighteousness. Man, in three verses, we were cleansed from all sin, forgiven of all sin, and cleansed of all the effects of sin called unrighteousness. Now watch, people, preachers, take verse 8 out of context and preach it all alone. And when you do that, it sounds like what they're making it say. But in verse 10, if you look, he repeats verse 8, but he clarifies it. He repeats verse 8. If we say we have no need for the blood. If we say we're righteous in our own self. If we say we have not sinned, he's not talking about this morning. He's not talking about right before service started in worship. <laughs> Guys, I've had people come to me and say, brother, you don't understand. Why are you preaching this? We always sin. We're always going to sin. I say, stop that. That's why you do frequently. <laughs> yeah, but brother, nobody's perfect. We always sin. And their consciousness is revolving around their ability to fail as if they have to justify something. So because they believe that's them, guess what the fruit is? If you make a tree good, if the tree starts believing what it is, a righteous tree, you make the tree good, guess what the fruit is? You don't try to change the fruit, you change the tree. You don't try harder, you believe different. A good tree can't bear... You know what we do? We hear Jesus say a good tree can't bear fruit. We all become fruit inspectors yeah. and tree assessors. And we say, well, then they can't be a good tree. And you know, well, I can't even be a good tree. I got this thing in my life. I've been in denial. I haven't even dealt with this thing. And I got this thing on my tree and a good tree can't bear bad fruit. And I got some bad fruit. And I look over there and I see they really got some bad fruit over there. They ain't no good tree. I don't care how high they're raising their hands in worship. They ain't no good tree. <laughs> But then he says something right after that. A bad tree can't bear. And you go, wait a minute. A bad tree can't bear good fruit. Not everything in my life's a throwaway. God has used me and God's done some good things through me. And I've realized some places I've grown and matured. So all of a sudden we're in a quandary. A good tree can't bear bad fruit. A bad tree can't bear. All of a sudden you've got to realize. He said, for there it's for you know them by their. What he's talking about is identity. You know a person and what he believes by what he produces. You know what he believes and sees that he is by what he produces. So he says, so make a tree. <coughs> Teach people who they are. Teach people who they've become. And their fruit will be according. But if you don't teach people who they are and people believe they're a bad tree, of course their fruit will be bad. He's not talking about trying harder. He's talking about believing right. He's talking about being to do. Yeah? That's really helpful to me. If we say we have not sinned, well, then we make him a liar because we have no need for the blood and there's no need for the cross and then Christ's a fool, right? That's another scripture about that. And his word is not... Can you flip to chapter 2, verse 1? Like, can, like it, we're just going to read the next line, but it happens to be another chapter, so I know that creates you have to change something up there. 1 John 2, the next chapter, verse 1, the very next verse. 
It's all right, buddy. We're all waiting for you. We're all looking. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I love you so much, man. Dude, you have no idea how happy I am you got up there. My, watch, 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 watch. If you walk in the light, he sees in the light. You'll fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus will cleanse you from... If you say you have no sin, no need of the blood, you're deceived, the truth's not in you. But if you confess your need for the blood and you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you of all unrighteousness. But if you say you have not sinned and have no need for the blood, you're going to miss this gift of righteousness. You're going to miss this cleansing of the blood. You're going to miss this forgiven of all sin and free from all unrighteousness, right? My little children, do you realize that these things I'm writing to you is that you may not sin? Right. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> watch, watch. He's not saying, but of course you know you always are going, and if you say you're not, liar. Yeah. My little children, I'm writing these things so you do not sin. See, here's what we argue about. We get into perfection all the time. Yeah, but brother, see, you're freaking me out with this message because you're saying we're perfect and we don't ever have to sin. And you get way out ahead of the, the, the cart. You get the horse or the cart way out ahead of the horse and you never just settle into believing what the blood did to receive the grace that changes your life so that you can become whatever's possible and what he paid for. Right. Ain't that something? That's in your Bible, ain't it? Watch this. Watch this. Little children, I write these things to you so you may not sin. And if, not when, if, not when. And if any man sins, listen, don't get condemned, don't give up, don't leave the church, don't say you weren't saved in the first place. Don't get... If you sin, man, understand we have an advocate and he's with the Father and his name is Jesus the righteous. And he's, see, can you hear? This is not a permission to stay the same. This is a call out into something new. Glory. I didn't find a way to sin and get away with it. Yeah. I found a way to be free. Yeah. It's called the just living by faith, and he paid the price. Watch this. He, he's the advocate. He's with the Father. Jesus, the righteous. He's ruling his kingdom with that scepter. He is the propitiation or the mercy for our sins. And watch this. This is why you can pray for unbelievers on the street and don't let anybody tell you you can't. Don't let anybody tell you that if they're not saved, they can't be healed. It's a flat-out lie, and people with no experience are speaking out of turn. Now, I know that sounds harsh, but I mean it. You probably have it taped. I'm not apologizing. We speak too many things out of turn. Yes. We speak into things we have no knowledge of. And just because you've never prayed for the sick doesn't mean he doesn't heal. And just because you never saw somebody healed doesn't mean he doesn't heal. I'm not being mean. I'm just being real. And I feel a little aggressive on it for some reason. I do. Look. He's the propitiation of mercy for our sins and not ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. That means mercy towards them, but you have to repent. Some people get misguided and take that one scripture right there and just preach everybody's okay, sin's already taken care of, nobody has to repent, that works, everything's done, it's a finished work, Jesus is Lord, and it's all cool. That's not the truth. You have to repent. His kingdom's here. You got to die to yourself. Pick up your cross and follow him. Don't proclaim a grace that allows you to stay the same or it's not grace at all. Because grace is what changes you. It's the etching tool of God. It's the sculpting tool of God. Grace is his workmanship. Yeah? yeah. Watch. You're his workmanship created in Christ then for good works. What's first? Image. What's next? Fruitfulness. You don't do fruitfulness for image, image for fruitfulness. You're his workmanship created in Christ, then for good works, which were predestined beforehand that you should walk in them. It's the scripture. You're saved by grace through faith, not of yourselves, for you're his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. He's been working on us to make us like him for good works. What comes first? Identity, workmanship, 
righteousness, sonship, clean, yea, holy, blameless, above reproach, going to bed without a veil over your face, waking up excited that he loves you. Yeah. Watch, anything else is a lie. It's wrong believing. I mean, even if you're struggling with an addiction or something, you can still walk this thing out. God, my life is so much more than this. God, I just separate myself from this and I no longer desire this thing. God, this thing's trying to break me down and, and condemn me and ruin me. God, I just want to know you and walk in you. I thank you that you see me clean and righteous and pure. You start talking like that in the midst of a struggle, I'm telling you the truth will swallow up your identity and new identity will swallow up the compulsion. I'm just telling you. Years ago, years ago, when I first got saved, there was this fellow, he had a conviction about smoking. I don't have any issues. I'm not here to preach about smoking. I'm just telling you, he had a conviction about it, and he felt like he should stop. And he felt like he was hurting his body, and that it was selfish towards his family, that if he's cutting his years short, that's not fair to everybody. And for the pleasure he was getting from smoking, he thought, this ain't worth it. I need to quit. Trouble is, when he tried to quit, he couldn't. Now he has a conviction, so every time he smokes a cigarette, he feels condemned. Every time he smokes a cigarette, he feels he's in bondage. Every time he smokes a cigarette, he doesn't feel good about himself. So guess what he was counseled and instructed to do? Not get deliverance and not just have more oil prayed over him. He was instructed that every time he lights up a cigarette, thank God that he's delivered from the power of darkness and translated into the kingdom of God's son and God's life. Yeah. And he said, well, that's hypocrisy. No, your heart's breaking. You don't want to smoke. You're just compelled and you can't stop, but you want to. So every time you light the cigarette, instead of getting grayed out and condemned and feeling far from God, start proclaiming that you're his son and that you're delivered from the power of darkness, that he loves you and that you're righteous in his sight. He said, wow, I'm smoking? <laughs> yep. A lot of preachers wouldn't agree with that. They'd say, that's hypocrisy and you're pounding him. Are you kidding? His heart's already broken. We're separating him from the lie. We're not going to allow him to believe that what he's doing is greater than what he did. Amen. So this man's smoking and, and he thinks, okay, and he does what a lot of people do, they're trying to quit. They think when I get down to the last cigarette, I just won't buy another pack. So the whole time he's lighting up a cigarette, he's feeling weird, he's feeling uncomfortable. And if you ask his testimony, he would tell you it was really strange and it felt really weird, but he would just light the cigarette. I thank you, I'm delivered from the power of darkness. <laughs> Translated the kingdom of son of your love. <laughs> I'm not a smoker, so I don't do a good play act of smoking. But. <laughs> So then he did this thing that most people do when they're trying to quit smoking. He emptied his pack and he thought, you know what, I ain't buying another pack. But shortly after there, he feels this compulsion and he pulls in for gas and he's pumping gas and guess where he's heading? Right in through the doors, right to the counter, give me a pack or whatever. So he gets the pack and he's sad and he's a little forlorn and he's thinking, uh, you know, he's kind of getting off the top and he's heading to his truck and he's like, Father, I just thank you that I'm delivered from the power of darkness. I'm translated into the kingdom, the son of your love. And he began to talk to the Lord a little. He got in his truck and he finished pumping gas and he got in his truck. And this, was, this was days in after his first pack was empty. He's getting a new pack, however many cigarettes were there, however many days it lasted. I don't know, I don't remember how many he smoked in a day. It's not, it's not important. What's important is that he got in his truck and he drove out and he was communing with God while he bought this other pack. Instead of doing what he used to do, I failed again, what a loser. Now I'm gonna to go to church and worship God and here I am, I can't even quit what I feel like I'm supposed to, well, what a loser. But he didn't do that. Father, thank you, etc. So he gets in his truck and he starts driving down the road. And he's heading wherever and all of a sudden he realizes, wait a minute, I didn't even tear open the pack and I didn't even get one out yet. And all of a sudden he looks and he thinks and goes, wait a minute, I don't even feel like I want to. And all of a sudden he goes, wait a minute, I don't even want to smoke. And all of a sudden he just starts weeping and crying and the compulsion to smoke was completely gone out of his life. <laughs> completely. The perpetuation for our sins, not only ours, but also for the whole world. In other words, mercy tries over, over just judgment. And Jesus healed everybody that he touched, agreed? And his blood wasn't shed yet. So every man he prayed for was guilty of sin. And he healed everyone, why? Because mercy triumphs over judgment and he was the mercy that came from God. He was the good news from heaven. Yeah, he was the hope in the horizon. And it's just so prolific and so real and so powerful that people couldn't get that help to get healed before he even shed his blood. His mercy was already rolling. You get it? Okay, so 
I just wanted to chop up that one little lie because who actually sees that we pull one-liners out? Well, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth's not in us. He's not talking about this morning. He's not talking about your present state. I've had people look at me sincere because of their former teaching in churches they've sat in. And they said, but Dan, we're always going to sin. Right now, you and I are probably sinning and don't even know it. Oh, right. <laughs> so you, you're probably, we sin while we're breathing, Dan. And I'm like, I think you need to get born again. <laughs> and then when you preach this, people want to, well, you don't think you even sin. I'm not even saying that. Nobody heard me say that. I don't relate to it. I don't identify through it. I identify through righteousness, walking in the light as he's in the light, a scepter of righteousness, holy blameless above reproach. Yeah? And that grace identifies the tree. And if the tree is good, guess what the fruit is? So I'm not a special guy. I'm not an extra goody goody. I don't have some victory in and of myself over sin. What I'm saying is grace empowers you to live what you couldn't live before. And it actually takes you farther than most of us would ever think possible. How's that for just throwing out a little teaser? Yeah. Because here's what we do. We compare ourselves among ourselves. Be honest. And we relate our experience to one another and we think everybody has to be struggling like we've struggled. I had a pastor not long ago say to me, Dan, you have to be careful with some of these things you're preaching because you have to understand that everybody, you can't say that every man, that you, you can live and don't have secrets. Every man has stuff he's dealing with. Every man has some kind of secret in his life. And I said, Pastor, I'm concerned. We need to talk. What's your secret? Because <laughs> in a minute, you're going to get up there and preach the gospel and preach on freedom and pray for deliverance. And you're telling me you're not even free. The reason people can't preach some of this stuff because they've never walked in it, so they don't believe it's real. So they preach themselves instead of Christ. Can we have fun? Can we do this? And then we'll just pray and be done. Is, it that, is that the time? The clock is not my friend tonight. Hebrews chapter 10. Can we go there? Hebrews, and that doesn't mean he makes coffee. Stop it. People say, see, God makes coffee. He wrote the book of Hebrews. He brews. He doesn't brew. Stop. <laughs> I've had people tell me that. <laughs> I'm just having so much fun, it's ridiculous. Hebrews 10. <laughs> it's a little wordy, but we'll follow. This will be good. For having... For the law, having a shadow of good, the law, taking their little critters. Just think if we lived that way, guys. Man, your little puppy, your kitty's in trouble. You got your little chinchilla, and now you just stumbled. Oh, there he goes, split in half. Oh, my goodness. All your little parakeets just laying there with their breasts cut open. It would be terrible. It might whip some of us into righteous living, huh? Your little hamster looking through the cage as you're getting on the internet and getting on the wrong site. <laughs> little hamster, I'm right next. No more pets. There's no more pets. <laughs> I don't know what's wrong with me right now. Help me. Somebody pray for me. For the law, it just had a shadow of good things coming. It wasn't the very image of those things. It could never with these sacrifices that are offered year by year, continually make the comers therefore perfect. Now watch. It's a contrast scripture. He's saying the first wasn't able, so the second is. So everywhere it says the first could, and it means the second could, and you'll see that real clear. So if the first covenant and the law, having a shadow of what was coming, couldn't make the ones that came perfect, complete, then the second one can you get it? For then would they not have ceased to be offered? Because the worshipers, once purged, once purified, would have no more consciousness of sin. It's supposed to be understood among us that the Christian should have no more consciousness of sin. It's the goal of the gospel. The first covenant couldn't do that. Every time they went back for more year after year, you know the priest would have to go in there, they'd tie a rope to him, he wore bells, because if he made a mistake, he'd fall dead. How would you like to be the next priest in line? And you're standing there and you hear the jingling and the moving, and it's jingling because he's shaking. <laughs> I 
and all of a sudden he does something that's just out of line, and all of a sudden you don't hear no bells. Oop. <laughs> then a couple of people pull the rope and drag him out through the curtain. It's true. <laughs> and then they take off his garments and put them on the next guy who's already shaking. <laughs> Year after year, and it says that that ritual alone made people conscious of their sins. Mm -hmm. wow. yeah. If they, if it would have been able, would it not have ceased to be offered? Because the worshippers once purged would have no more consciousness of sin. But in these sacrifices, year after year, there's a reminder, a remembrance, again, made of sins every year. For it is not possible, which means it is possible, the blood of Jesus, it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats, your little hamster and parakeet, would ever take away sin. <laughs> Next verse. Wherefore, then he come into the world, he says, sacrifice and offering thou would not, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings, in this is Jesus talking, Sacrifices for sin you had no pleasure. Then I said, lo, I've come in the volume of the book. It is written of me. This is Jesus talking, guys. To do thy will, O God. Above, when he said sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offerings for sin you had no pleasure in, which are offered by the law, then he said, lo, I've come to do your will, O God. Okay, you can just scroll. Verse 10. By which will we are been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest man, every priest standing daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifice which can never take away sin. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. From henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. Watch this. For by one offering he has perfected forever those who are set apart with a holy calling. Do you see it? Yes. Do you see consciousness of sin or no consciousness of sin? Let's go to Romans 6, if you could, my friend. Hey, is that, is it, what, what translation is that? That's King James. You don't have new King James? You can't stick an N on the front and trick the computer? It'll, no? Okay. I thought, man, I'm reading King James. That's Okay. Romans 6, we'll do it with King James. See, the only reason I ask for New King James is because I read out all the time, so when I quote, I don't want to confuse you. Romans, Romans, that's okay, Romans. He's still drinking coffee up there, man. He's trying to get God to brew, he brews. <laughs> Romans 6, my friend. Oh, there it is. Okay, the reason he starts off with a question is because of the way he ends 5. He says, where sin abounded, grace did abound. So he knows how people will think. Okay, sin abounded, so grace abounded more. So maybe right. we'll just keep on sinning because God's grace will keep on coming. Right. That's weird. That's wrong teaching. <laughs> Paul addresses it. What shall we say? Shall we continue in sin? How many people do you realize in this country have been taught that Christianity is a prayer to go to heaven, not a dying to yourself? Yeah. Just a prayer to go to heaven. It's, just, it's something that blesses me, not changes me, right? So we don't realize this, but we have to understand that when you become a Christian, you're dying to your old life and you're dying to sin. You're dying in the likeness of his death. Watch this. This is the gospel right here. This chapter is so powerful. It's amazing, and I'm glad it's on the board. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin so grace may abound? Well, God forbid. Of course not. How shall we that are dead to sin live therein any longer? Watch. Do you not know? Know ye not? Do you not know? Right? 
So maybe some of us don't know. Maybe that's why we teach. If Paul says, know ye not, it must be important to know because you're destroyed for the lack of knowledge. So in all you're getting, get understanding. So none of this is in vain, guys. If we don't know this, we're not going to walk in this. Right. He says, know ye not, three or four times in this chapter. Why? Because maybe we don't. Know ye not, do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Well, what's his death? We'll find out in a minute. Watch this. It's important. You have to know that you were baptized and buried with Jesus into death. Therefore, if we were buried in baptism into his death, that like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so, you will walk in the newness of life. For if we've been planted together in the likeness of his death, that's the third time now that he's said that in three verses. So we better find out what the likeness of his death is. For if we've been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also. See, it's not just about dying, it's about living. We shall also be in the likeness of his. Whew. So powerful. You can just scroll the page for us, buddy, whenever. Thank you. Knowing this, you better know there's knowing again. You got to know this. Knowing that your old man, the man you were a moment ago, the man you were before Jesus, the man you were before baptism, that man, your old man, is crucified with him. When he died, you died. When he was buried, you were buried. When he raised, you raised. Come on, this is so important. That the, watch, your old man was crucified with him that the body of sin might be... Does that sound like, yeah, but brother, you're always going to sin, you're always going to miss it, ain't nobody perfect. What are you saying, you're perfect? Does this language sound like that lie? Guys, we have heard that. Yeah, but we're always going to sin, brother. We're never perfect. We're always going to... You hear people say that at the drop of... In a spur of the moment, it just flies out of the mouth. They've been so trained by it that they camp there and keep producing fruit there. Duh. Watch. Watch this. And God's not a blasphemer. Watch this. This is his word. It's not my sermon. It's his word. <laughs> Knowing this, our old man is crucified with him that the body of sin would be destroyed and henceforth we would not serve sin. Watch. He who has died. Now if you just pray a prayer to go to heaven, you might still be angry at your boss. You might still have big major time spats and issues with your spouse. But when you die to yourself, things begin to change and you take responsibility for expressions and weakness that aren't producing righteousness and God begins to change your life. Yeah? yeah? Come on, if you just pray a prayer to get something from God, you might not become something by God. <coughs> this thing is not about your blessing. It's about your transformation. And in the transformation is blessing practically unspeakable. The day I live free from myself, I don't even understand care, fear, anxiety, because it's about his kingdom now. It's about laying down your life. It's about loving not your own life unto death. And all those things that were normal to me now become foreign, and they don't exist in the new perspective that he's given me. Yeah? Ugh. For he that is dead, he who has died, is what? You're what? Don't be afraid to say it. It's the word of God. I'm not tricking you. Your Bible says that when you live this way, you're free from sin. That should feel good to say, free from sin. Man, we've been taught so wrong on some of this stuff, and people haven't even realized that they treat taught They just taught through experience. We've taught through the way we've lived our lives, and we haven't believed and got called up into this life that's empowered by grace. He who has died is what? Now, we still didn't find out what his death is. We're buried into his death, because here he's saying this. If we be dead with Christ, that means buried into his death, so we better find out here. If we be dead with Christ, we believe we shall also live with him. So he said that several times. So it's not just about dying, it's about living. Oh, here's knowing again. Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dies no more. Death has no what? Okay, so for the Christian, does death have dominion over the Christian? So is man ever going to die? 
So he's the end of the fear of the bondage of death. That stop letting death be our motivation in prayer. Your motivation in prayer is the promise of life, longevity, length of days, and fulfilled testimony, right? You're not praying because we're afraid we're going to die. We're praying because we're promised life and we want to live our life to the full and run well and leave a mark and a legacy. We're not trying to survive. We're not trying to extend our time because we're not afraid of death. We're never going to die. We're not driven by sentiment. We live by the Spirit. Are you guys okay? Yes. It's not often people talk that straight and plain. We just pray because we have need most of the time. We pray because we're sentimental. We pray because, oh my gosh. And it's why we pray and pray and pray and a lot of times see very little activity in those situations. I'm just saying. Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dies no more, death has no dominion over him. Now we're going to find out what we were buried into. Remember, you were buried into the death of Jesus Christ. You were buried into the baptism of his death, right? Watch, here's his death. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But in that he lives, because it's not just about dying, it's about living. In that he lives, he lives what? Likewise, because we're one and he made us one, likewise, you reckon ye. That means you reckon yourselves dead indeed unto sin and alive unto God through Christ Jesus our Lord. How can you live in righteousness and live dead to sin and still boast in your ability to fail and call it humility. <laughs> How can you reckon yourself dead to sin and stay conscious of it in your language? You can't. Isn't it amazing that so many of us have? Isn't it amazing that we've argued over it and fought over it and sinned in the process? Let not sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in its lust. Neither yield to your members as instruments of unrighteousness because you're born again and unto sin. But yield yourself to God. So you don't wake up every day expecting to fail. You wake up every day accepted in the beloved. You wake up every day righteous in his sight. You wake up every day holy, blameless, and above reproach. You wake up every day, wow, reckon dead to sin and alive unto God. You put off, you put on, yay. The just shall live by Come on, guys, this is important if you're going to bear fruit. If you're just trying to get through life and hoping you make it, you're in a different gospel. It's some kind of survival kit gospel that's not real. We're not trying to make it through the day. We wake up to look like him. And no matter what comes, no matter what happens, we live by faith. We're pilgrims, guys. We're sojourners. We're passing through. <laughs> We have a homeland. This is not our home. Yeah. We're just passing through. Yeah. And we're going to leave our mark and take as many with us on the trail as we can. Yeah, right. But we are passing through. <laughs> so we're not going to yield our members to unrighteousness. We're going to wake up every day and yield our members unto God for righteousness, right? We're going to be alive from the dead and our members instruments of righteousness unto God for sin shall not have dominion over us because we're not under the law. What that means is we're under grace. Even if you fail, fall into weakness, uh, just vent and fall apart in a moment and realize a weakness that's still lingering. Don't fall apart. You're not under the law. It's not about failure. It's about becoming. So you're not under the law, you're under grace. But at the same time, he's so sharp when he writes this. The Lord's amazing. He says, what then? Shall we sin, disregard it? Oh, well, it's the way we are. God understands. So that because we're not under the law, but under grace, God forbid we already established that. Yeah. Well, don't worry about it. God still loves me. That's not the point. God always loves you. It's about you being so touched by the love of God that you love him back with your life without trying so hard. Yeah? Yeah. Know ye not, to whom you yield yourself a servant to obey, that servant you are, to whom you obey, whether of sin to death or obedience to righteousness. But God be thanked that you are, you were, you were servants of sin, 
but now you've obeyed from the heart, watch, the form of doctrine which was delivered to you. Now, I'm not saying these guys aren't preaching this, but I'm saying I just did. You can't say this doctrine wasn't delivered to you. You can't say I didn't know this. And if I got the mic and I got preaching, I got four, three, four sessions, this kind of stuff comes out of me a lot. Why? Because we're supposed to be taught as you've been taught. When you see a scripture as you've been taught, it would really be good if we've been taught. <laughs> you can go to some of those scriptures and say as you've been taught, and some of us have never even heard of it. We've been taught the opposite. That's not a mistake. There's a strategy out there to suppress the kingdom and stop the power of God. It's not a mistake that so many teachings got twisted and turned from what they say. Not that men did it intentionally, but somewhere along the line it slowly changed. And I think it's because we got tricked into preaching our experience instead of his life. But God be thanked, though you were servants of sin, and slaves of sin, you obeyed from the heart the doctrine which was delivered. <laughs> Look, he says it again. Being then made free. Yay. <laughs> you became a servant of righteousness. You look up the word uh, servant or slave, depends what translation you look up. You look up a slave under righteousness, you've been made a slave under God. It means chained and bound to do its will and serve its testimony. You're chained and bound to righteousness to do its will and serve its testimony. Like you have no other option. You like have a life sentence to righteousness. <laughs> Yay. I speak in human terms. I speak after the manner of men, so you can tell I quote the King James or the New King James all the time. I speak in the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh, the weakness of your flesh. For as you've yielded your members of servants unto uncleanness and to iniquity unto, or iniquity unto iniquity, meaning there's a progression, even so, now, now, yield. Wake up in the morning, yield your members as servants unto righteousness for its fruit to what? What's righteousness produce? Isn't that amazing? He rules his kingdom with the scepter of righteousness. Watch. When you believe righteousness and that he sees you righteous, it'll automatically produce holiness in your life without you biting your lip trying to be holy. It never works. It's the fruit of righteousness. So if you're producing holiness without biting your lip to be holy, then grace is having its way in you, and who gets all the glory? And because you're living that way and haven't tried and you didn't bite your lip to change, God's changing you in that belief. All of a sudden you love him all the more and he's more real to you than ever before. And all of a sudden you're living what was never possible. And now you're closer and more empowered and more mature than ever before. And then you try to preach it and people say, well, yeah, but brother, we're always going to sin. Yeah, but what are you saying? You're perfect? What are you saying? You don't sin? You're freaking me out. Man, that's heresy. And then when you look at scripture, we realize we don't even understand and we're speaking out of turn. Right. Now, if I challenged you and you'd be honest and we do a show of hands, you'd be amazed how many people, if they were honest, had never just woke up in the morning ever in their Christian life, in this room. I'm not being judgmental, I'm telling you. And just said, Father, I thank you that I'm free from sin. I thank you that you judge me in righteousness and I'm clean and pure and holy in your sight. God, I thank you that I have every reason to be excited and encouraged today because you live in me and you've empowered me and I'm so glad to be your child and I thank you, Holy Spirit, that you live through me effectively and today's going to matter and time's going to remember today. I thank you, Father, that my life isn't an accident I ain't limping along. Your life is inside of me and I'm encouraged and I thank you. I assure you, there's a lot of folks sitting here that haven't thought that way, let alone prayed that way. I'm not saying we haven't prayed, but a lot of times it's God, I hope my day goes good. I hope you get a good grip on my boss's attitude because he's getting a little trying and testing. I might need to be looking for a new job. And God, I just thank you that the car is going to run right now. I hope I don't hit too many red lights because I might be running late this morning. <laughs> oh, yeah, I prayed. <laughs> say it. I wonder if this gospel would teach everyone I'm looking at tonight to wake up, to go to bed tonight with a clear conscience, no matter what it's been like right up till now, that you actually step out in faith and start where you finished and wake up tomorrow and say, Father, I thank you for your love. I thank you that today I'm righteous in your sight and the blood of Jesus has spoken better things and I'm starting this day clean in your sight. You've breathed life into me. God, I thank you I'm not a sinner waiting to fail. I'm a son, I'm a daughter being raised up in righteousness. Mold me, shape me, perfect me, cause me to be more mature. Let the expression of my life be the glory of who you are and let men know you because you're revealing yourself to me.
Wonder if you talked like that and meant it and stayed in that conversation with God for days, weeks, months, years. Yeah? And refuse to be, grow weary in well-doing. Refuse to let life eat your lunch and things sneak up on you in the old way you thought to just have a voice. Because I'm telling you, too many of us have just believed discouragement in a heartbeat. Whatever in a heartbeat. We haven't been the best stewards of our heart, but we can be. I'm not saying you personally. If the shoe fits, wear it and then kick it off. Say, whoops, never again. I'm not saying that to put that on you. I'm saying don't let that be you. So how do you get away with this or from this? Now being made free from sin, you become slaves or servants unto God and you have your fruit unto... Second time he says it in three verses. Look up there at the top. Righteousness unto holiness. Look at verse 22. Your fruit unto holiness. Why? Free from sin. What's the fruit of believing you're free from sin? Being a slave or a servant unto God and your fruit unto holiness. And the end of that life is what? Everlasting life. Whoa! For the wages of sin is death. So when you think sin and you stay sin conscious, you're actually abiding in a realm of death. It's right there. But the gift of God is eternal life and it's through Jesus Christ and He surely is our Lord. You get it? Is that awesome or what? I got so late it's ridiculous. I had no intention of preaching that long, but I did, so I can't apologize because there's no way to take that back. <laughs> Sorry. I thought in my mind, in my heart, I would preach to about 8.30 and we were going to do a couple things. But I want to do something with you real quick right now. Can I do something with you? Yeah. So we've been forgiven of sin. So if any man's in Christ, he's a what? So if he's a new creation, old things have what? So let's slow down. Old things, old things, anything before him, have what? Behold, power of God. God does it. Behold. It's the power of God. Behold all things, what? It's amazing. The Bible says in Romans 10, or Romans 5, 5, Romans 5, 10, I had it backwards. Uh, it says that we were reconciled through the body of his death. And if we were reconciled through the body of his death, much more shall we be saved from wrath through him because he's alive. You get it? Which means you don't get in the kingdom what you earned and deserve. It means that all things are made new and you're redeemed. I'm going to pray for, for some folks I, and then we're going to do something else. And, and if, you, if you get done before us, you'll just have to slip out and be polite and just slip out, okay? But I believe God wants to heal a lot of things tonight. Now this is what I've learned. I've just seen it. I was just at a recovery center last week and got to pray for a whole bunch of people. I'm excited about all the testimonies, but I... I do have one testimony. Actually, I have several from that, from that weekend, but I have one in the light of redemption. So, 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 okay, so the girl's doing drugs. The girl's living promiscuous. You got the picture? And now she gets born again. So she wishes she didn't live that way, and she knows there's a higher life for her. She can't look back and regret. She can't go back and change her actions. She can't go back and erase yesterday but today can become new. So as soon as she repents and says she's sorry for what she did, and if she knew, if she had a chance, but see, you don't, but you know, if you had a chance to go back and do some things over, man, you'd do some things different. Now that you know what you know, right. who can relate to that? Yes. But here's the thing, you can't go back and do that. So regret would produce, re regret would produce death because the regret doesn't change a thing, and that's what we get lulled into. <laughs> regret, oh, I wish I didn't do that. Why did I have to, man, I should but it's godly sorrow leads to repentance. So all of a sudden you become changed. So watch this. You can never change where you've been and what you've done, but you can change. So when you change, guess what God does through righteousness? Sees you as if you've never done what you've done. Come on, this is exciting, actually. I'm not asking you to cheer or clap, but I'm just telling you, you got to bear... I know I talked a long time, but this is important, so just hang on there. Just shake yourself free for a minute and say, oh, I'm not sitting too long. This will be all right. I'm going to get through this. Watch this. <laughs> you can't change where you've been and what you've done, but you can change. When you change and you would go back and do different, you're no longer the person that did what was guilty. you were guilty of. It's the beauty of repentance. 
Do you know that the people crucified Jesus, right? And on the day of Pentecost, Peter, by the Spirit, said, this Jesus, whom you crucified, and the Spirit of God went like a laser into their heart. Sorry, I just spit on you, I think. I'll back up. It probably missed you, but it was anointed. I could feel it when it came out. It was buzzing. It was like, man, I hope it missed you. It was big. I saw it out of the corner of my eye. I caught it in the light. I said, oh my goodness, I just spit on that young lady. It scared me. I was like, oh Jesus. I think it missed you though, or I'd see it. (laughs) It was that. It was anointed. You just rub it in. (laughs) I'm so lost now. (laughs) I'm so distracted now. Day of Pentecost, whom you crucified. It says they were cut to the heart. What happened? The denial was gone. The blindness was gone. All of a sudden, this whole crowd of people were standing there remembering, yelling Barabbas, and realizing they were guilty of the death of the Son of God, that they actually crucified their Savior, and they knew it and saw it for the first time. That's intense. That's not shoplifting. That's not doing 85 and a 65. They just became guilty in their heart of killing the Son of God. (laughs) Slow down with this thing. Don't rush. Don't just read your Bible for theology's sake. Watch this. These are real people. The Spirit of God came upon them and convinced them. Boom. They were guilty. He was the Lord. And they saw it. And it says they were cut to the heart. Study it out. It's an extreme expression of emotion. In their culture, they were probably tearing their clothes and throwing dirt everywhere in the air. It's just something they did. They were probably rending their garments. They were probably pulling their hair out. Because they were overcome with the guilt of the death of the Savior. Their long-awaited Messiah, they were too blind to see him, and they killed him. And all of a sudden, they, they saw that. Now they're guilty in their own heart. Not in a court of law, in their own heart. And they said something interesting. They were cut to the heart, and they said, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And when you look at it, you realize it's not a question. They believe they're hopeless. Where do we go from here? We killed our long-awaited Messiah. We murdered him. What what do we do now? He's not asking. They're not asking a question. How do we make this right? They're saying we don't. We we don't even have any hope. What shall we? Where do we go from here? That's the question they're asking. Men and brethren, what shall we do? What? Where do we go from here? What do we do now? Oh my goodness! Are you? Peter takes it as a question. You can't convince me they were asking a question. It was a cry of despair. And Peter takes it as a question and says, repent, wish you didn't kill him. I realize you killed him, just wish you didn't kill him and I'll tell you what, God will forgive you all sins, you get baptized for the removal of the sins of your life and what you've done and killing him and come on in and you can all be sons. It's in your Bible. Wait, stop. Peter, get a grip. Look, I know you got that crazy fire on your head and you're talking in funny words and language, but you need to take a breath and run this by me again. I'm guilty of the death of my Savior and the Son of God, and I screamed Barabbas when Pilate gave me a choice. And you're telling me, wish I didn't do that, and it'll all be good with God, and I can step in and actually become a son, even though I killed the son. Yeah, because as soon as you change, you're no longer the one that killed him. And if you had a chance to do it over, you wouldn't kill him. You're not the one that's guilty. I'll let you go. It's the power of repentance. And we want to complicate this thing and feel guilty for five years and talk about our sin for four weeks and ask for forgiveness 54 times. God is amazing. But we killed your boy. Yeah. He died for your redemption. Just wish you didn't kill him. Now that you see, what would you do? Father, forgive him. So maybe God forgave him and gave him some understanding and put some light on the thing. And they went, we really messed up. I wish we could do this one over. Sorry, you can't. Well, then what? Nothing. You can't make it right. But you've been made right. You wish you didn't do it. You'll never be judged for the ones that did. Come on into my kingdom and be my kids.
It's in your Bible. Here's what I want to pray for real quick. And only this group of people. And then we're going to do something else real quick and we'll try to get done, okay? Are you guys okay? It's a Saturday night. Are you guys okay? Because I apologize. I got late. I, I talked. I preached long. It was good, but it was long. <laughs> Stop that. That's not... <laughs> I mean, I wish that could work. If we could... <laughs> Maybe even shoot to the West Coast. And... <laughs> Back it up. 642 would look nice right now. So uh, here's what I learned in my life. Last week, this girl went to her doctor and got blood tests because her lifestyle gave her HIV. HIV is not cool. You don't want a doctor to tell you you have HIV, right? It's probably not the best diagnosis. So this girl heard the message of redemption. She's got medical papers and everything. It's really cool. She's so excited. She has HIV. I said, are you a prostitute anymore? Are you promiscuous? Do you stick needles in your arm? Do you wish you never did? Yeah. That's a good answer. I love your tears. It tells me that your answer. So let's just pray that HIV get out of your body because it's not who you are anymore. So if God won't judge you for where you've been, why is where you've been judging you? And if old things pass away, and that was before, and all things are new, why is it still here? Maybe we ought to tell it to go. Amen. But we told it to go, and that's not presumptuous and arrogant. At least don't tell the HIV, because it, it went for it. Because she just got her blood test back, and it's undetectable in her body. It's really fun to look at somebody and see them cry while they're holding their medical papers all rolled up in their hand and cry. And know that they had it and now they don't. Because of his great love. It's not magic. It's not abracadabra. It's not name of Jesus. It is name of Jesus, but it's not name of Jesus. You, right? It's truth making men free. Amen. Yeah? yeah? Yep. So in her actions, in her choices, in her lifestyle, did she deserve and bring upon herself HIV? So guess what people think? Well, I earned this. I deserve this. I did this to myself. At least he forgives me. At least he loves me. At least I'm going to heaven. No, no, no. If you could go back and do some things over, you would, so you're not the same. So that thing that you inherited isn't yours. You got it? Now, this is what I learned. In a room this size, there's a whole lot of people that are carrying some form of some mark of yesterday's mistake. Some form, some mark. Some people have carried an STD into their marriage. They've had to jump that hurdle for years. Some people have passed along to their spouse and they've just said, oh, well, it's the way it is. I love you. We'll just... That thing can come out of your marriage tonight. There's people you've carried something for 15 years because you made a mistake when you were 17. But if you could go back, you'd do it over. But you can't. So <laughs> regret would bring death. But godly sorrow brings repentance. And repentance brings vindication and clearing of yourself. It's scripture. I was in a service like this, and a lady was 17. She slept with a boy that she was sure she would marry. It's a little early to know that, but she fought into that. She had vowed, had a little purity ring from youth group. Not making fun. That was her intention. Sure. She said outright, fell in love. Well, he's going to be my husband anyway. I got the feelings for him. We might as well just go ahead and get it on a little bit here. Right. All of a sudden, the relationship shifted and changed. The next thing you know, they weren't even together. But now we got a problem. She has the most severe case of genital warts three or two or three specialists have ever seen. 24-7 profusely covered vaginal warts. 24-7 profuse. She's so ashamed. She's brought it on herself, but she's a good Christian girl with good Christian integrity. She got her emotions mixed up at a young age of 17 and jumped in bed with a boy that she figured would be her husband. Now he's out of the picture, but she's got the results of her promiscuity. I'm at the service preaching, and guess how old she is now? 34. 
17 long years have slipped by, but to her not long because she's truly in love with Jesus, Tom. And she's allowed him to be her husband. Because here's what she said. I'm embarrassed about my condition. I don't want to bring a man into it. It's so unsightly, and I don't expect a guy to understand. I'll just live celibate. I'll just live and let Jesus be my husband. I sure would have loved to have been a wife. I sure would love to be a mother. But I guess my actions canceled that, and I'll just go on and live this out and let Jesus be my all and be the best Christian girl I can be. So she had an amazing attitude, but she's being robbed of something. It's called redemption. Redemption brings things back to original. So I'm teaching this message. She's sitting there crying. I don't know what's going on. In fact, in that church, it was several thousand people. It was very big. It was 3,000 people. And, and I'm sharing, and she's in the congregation crying. And when I had the audit call, of course, out of 3,000 people, there was a whole lot of people that came up front. So we just kind of prayed over them corporately and just kind of prayed over them. And, and, and then they all went back to their seats. 24-7, 17 years, profuse genital work. She goes to her door after service and she got her key out. She's unlocking the door to her apartment and the Spirit of the Lord comes upon her in the doorway. And he said, don't be ashamed to go in and look at what I've done to your body. Her heart's thumping. She's nervous. She runs in and inspects her body and cries and cries and cries because there's not one single vaginal wart on her body. Not one. She falls asleep on her bed about daybreak, wee hours. She's just overwhelmed, crying on her bed, crying on her bed. She drifts off to sleep. She wakes up and thinks, surely this is a dream. She takes another look at her body and just goes back to crying. She comes into church. She's just crying. She pulls me, pastor, his wife, into a room and tells us the whole story. All they know is she's an amazing, committed, surrendered young lady who's in leadership. But she's carrying a mark from 17 years ago sin that was forgiven, that she's not a person that had But you say, well, then why didn't it just leave? Because some of us think we deserve it. Some of us say, well, I brought it upon myself. Some of us say, well, I should have known better. Some of us allow that thing to stay because we believe we should have it because of what we did and where we've been. But you know what's amazing? There's people in this room that deserve a mark and don't have one. There's people in this room that made more mistakes than some people that are carrying a mark. I know one lady that didn't have one single sexual sin in her whole life. And she's in her early 50s. The only man she knew in her whole life was her husband. It's actually so honorable and so holy. The world calls it boring. God calls it holy. One man her whole life. They're in their early 50s and they're married 30 couple years or 30 years. And he gets his eyes on a 35-year-old girl and all of a sudden he leaves her and goes with the 35-year-old girl. So there's the 52-year-old lady that's been married and only ever known this man without a husband. Now she's spinning and she's in a whirlwind. Her emotions are falling apart. She's thinking womanhood stuff. She's thinking early 50s. She's thinking, I've lost it. He doesn't have an eye for me. I can't turn his head. She's getting into worldly perspective now and making things matter that don't really matter. She's letting one man's sin, weakness, and depravity, and deception roll over on her and identify her wrongly. Not one sexual sin in her whole life, and she starts to interpret her life through her husband's sexual sin. In a matter of no time, this fella comes into her life and starts telling her things that she needs to hear and wishes she could hear. And in no time, Mr. Tom, she's in bed with that man and has never done anything like that in her whole life. It was the saddest, most heart-ripping story you've ever heard in your life when you're standing at the altar and she grabs your arm and says, I'm not that kind of girl, I'm not that kind of girl. And you go, because you know what she's saying. <laughs> And she's crying it over and over, saying, I'm not that kind of girl. And I said, shh, honey, I told you, I don't need to know. It's none of my business. She said, no. And she grabbed my arm and pulled me in and told me the whole story in my ear. Shortly after, she said, in the act, she dumped in bed with this man, and in the act of things unfolding, they were in the act of what they were doing. And in the middle of that thing, she said, it wasn't long in. She said, probably not even a minute. Reality hit me. Can you imagine? And I was horrified. And there I am, laying with this man, with nothing on it. I'm going, oh my God. And she said, I pulled myself from him and said, I can't stop. And she said, I bawled and I grabbed my things and I ran. Can you imagine the torment? Can you imagine how she was feeling? 
being sincere and never having a sexual and crossing in and knowing that this is not her answer. And she's driving home and she says she just cries and cries and she just feels so ah. Oh. Well, now we got a real problem because right after that, symptoms start flaring in her body and things start happening. She goes to her family doctor, lifelong family doctor. He sits down in the room with her and says, honey, you need to talk to me. What's going on in your life? She said, why? Because I've just diagnosed you with an incurable STD that's in your nervous system and it's going to shorten your life and quench out your liver. And he knew she was married. Where'd you get this ST? One sexual mishap that lasted maybe 40 seconds in her whole life. And an incurable disease grabs her nervous system. There's no mercy out there. And it's not fair. There's mercy in him. And he's more than fair. So she's crying, telling me she's not the kind of girl. She tells me the whole story. She's got me ripped. I'm ripped. I'm like so ready to pray for her. And I looked at her and I said, honey, look at me. She looks down at the ground. Look at me. She looks at me. I make her. I said, that's coming out of you. Do you hear me? And there ain't nothing nobody can do about it. It's too late. You say, where do you get off saying that? Leave me alone. I knew exactly what I was saying. I said that to her, and there was no fire, no lightning, no thundering voice. I just said, I called out the STD, she told me what it was, it was a form of HPV, it was a form of herpes, that was incurable, it was in her nervous system. I said, you get out of her body, and don't you ever return. I just walked to the next person, left her there, she sobbed, went on. I went back to that church six weeks later for certain reasons. She came running up to me. She said, Pastor, Pastor. I said, yeah. She said, guess what? I said, what? I've been to the doctor. They've run every sort of test. They've tested me several times. It's not there. It's not there. And I didn't freak out and rejoice and do what we think we're supposed to because God was still teaching through me. I just smiled and looked at her. And I was super thankful. Believe me, I wanted to do cartwheels. If I stayed real cool and calm. And I said, of course it isn't there. So I said to her, I said, of course it isn't there. Do you know why? And guess what she said? She said, because God is awesome. He's merciful. He's loving. He's so kind. Who knows she's totally right? Who knows that's why it's not there? But I said, honey, that's not the answer I was looking for. And she looked at me cockeyed like that's the only answer. And it is the only answer, but here's what we don't understand. Everything she just proclaimed God to be needs a place to land in your life. God can be so merciful, but you have to receive his mercy. God can love you, but you have to receive his love. So I looked at her. I said, do you know why it's not there? And she said, yeah, because God is. And she said all the things. She just praised him. I mean, she really said the right things. And I laughed and I said, well, he is all those things, but that's not the answer I was looking for. She looked at me perplexed. I said, let me tell you why that's not in your body. It was so fun. I tipped her little chin and looked in her eyes and I said, because you're not that kind of girl. <laughs> oh, that's so profound, right? Oh! And she goes, <laughs> See what's wrong with me? <laughs> so I'm either a very twisted man and I lie, or God does this stuff, and I like it. Here's where we're at right now. Is there somebody want to touch some keys for me or something? Can somebody help me? I don't need the whole clan. I just need a little bit of just keys. Because we're just going to do something short and sweet. Not that I don't appreciate the whole clan. Believe me. You guys are awesome. You all right? Hey, you, me, and Jesus is plenty, all right? <laughs> you know what I mean when I say just love him on your instrument, on the keys? You know what I mean, right? Just loving him on your, on your piano, man. It'll be great. Here's what I need you to do quickly. We're going to do this quickly. I don't do anything quick. I'm asking you two to help me out because, because I don't do anything. I'm asking you to pick up the slack. 
If you have sickness in your body, I'm not asking you to come up right now. We're going to touch that in a second. The only people I want to respond are the people that fit that description. You lived in a way, might have been a lack of temperance. Listen, one night you could have just got mad and went out and binged and did something you've never done before and went farther than you ever went before and just got so intoxicated or so messed up. And from that night, you've never felt the same. You feel like your concentration is lost, your memory is a little, that something ain't right about your body since that night. You might have done something over and over again. You feel like you hurt your heart, your liver, your kidneys. You might have been told because of lifestyle, because of choices, you affected this or affected that. You might have something in your blood. You might have a disease. You might already know that. It might be an STD. It might be hepatitis C. I promise you, I have lost track of people healed of this stuff. It's beautiful to see. If he forgives you, he'll restore you. I just believe it. And the blood is speaking better things. Here's what I need you to do. The reason I need people to come up here, I, I asked the Lord a long time ago, I said, Lord, why isn't this just fall in the category of healing? Why isn't this part of the healing service? He said, most people won't even ask for this stuff to be healed because they feel like they earned it and deserved it and should have known better and brought it upon themselves. He says, there's a component of condemnation and shame that needs destroyed. Yeah? I had a lady in my hometown come to a healing service who had HIV, what well, was AIDS. She's a 150 pound woman on her normal day. She's six foot, precious black lady in the city. She's a six foot tall woman that weighs 150 when she's healthy. She was 106 pounds when I met her. 106 pounds on a six foot woman that's 150 pound frame does not look well. And all her friends were saying, what's wrong with you? And she said, I'm fine. Well, you're so thin. Thin's good. She was dying of AIDS and wouldn't tell anybody. You know why? Because when she hit 50, she got that midlife crazy thing. That's a lie from hell. And she thought, if I can sleep with a couple men and they'll sleep with me. She's the church lady. She's a church mother. But she's struggling in her emotions. And she thinks if somebody's going to sleep with her, it's going to mean she's a woman? Are you kidding me? Somebody will sleep with you because they got issues. You don't have to be beautiful for a guy to sleep with you, ladies. They just have urges. Hello? Boy, that didn't sit well. <laughs> We've been so trained by the world. You think if somebody wants you, it makes you special? It means they have need. I'm saying, take Jesus out of the picture. I'm not talking about marriage covenant. I'm not talking about the beauty of intimacy. I'm talking about the stuff that happens in our lives growing up. Sorry, I'm not more romantic about it. I'm just raw. Look, a guy can get aroused through a picture on a magazine. It doesn't take much. It's no compliment when a man wants to sleep with you. It's a compliment when he wants to lay down his life for you. Most men will sleep with you. But you need to find that one to lay down his life for you and love you like Jesus loves his church. Yeah? yeah. Come on, I'm not going to soft pedal this thing. It's the area in life that has caused more pain than anything. I love you has been misused a thousand times over to get our way and to meet a need and to gratify a compulsion. It's all right I talked this straight. Boy, I felt that thing did not fly in the room. Look, you might have made a mistake when you were young. You might have made a mistake a week ago. But that thing caught up with you and now you have something because of it. But in your heart, you learned a hard, painful lesson, but a lesson nonetheless. And if you had the choice and the chance to go back and change what you did, you would, but you can't. But you change. I'm telling you, that's the thing called repentance that qualifies this kind of move of redemption. That if you could look in your heart and say, if I could go back and do things different now that I know what I know, things would be different. That'll separate you from where you've been and what you've done. So if you come up here with a situation you're carrying in your life since you've been saved that came from your former days or even after you got saved, you made some mistakes and it caught up with you and marked you in some way. And you want that thing to go. When you come up here, here's what you're saying. It's not about shame and people saying, I wonder what they did. Everybody in this room practically deserves some kind of mark at some level and just might not have got marked. What you're saying is when you come up here is this is not who I am. 
and I'm not leaving the way I came. Amen. He loves me. He forgives me. And I'm not the person I was. And then I'm going to look you in the eyes up here and ask you, and some of you will feel like you need to cry. Don't you cry wrong tears. You cry tears of redemption, tears that he loves you, period. But when you come up here, I'm going to look at everybody and have you look me in the eyes and say, listen, let me ask you one question. If you could go back and change some things now that you understand some things, would you? And most everybody that comes up here is going to be emphatic and say, yes. Then you're not the person that did what you remember being done. So if God won't judge you for where you've been, then we can't let where you've been keep judging you. Because mercy triumphs over judgment. And the goodness of God leads men to change. What a gospel, man. I'm glad you believe it.